Hello, there we go, it's on good evening. Glad to be back with you. It's going to be a good night once again. Brother Don Whip has already told me what he's going to be preaching. And I, know, I said, well, if you preach that, they're going to like it. He's going to go to the book of Revelation, talk to you about heaven. So I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, let's pray. We'll begin. I ask God to bless it. And uh, then we're going to let our singers lead us in some song. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the good week you've already given, for the way that you've worked in our hearts. And God, the way that you've just opened our eyes to see things that we need to see. God, help us tonight to once again hear from you. God, help us to worship with open hearts that are in love with you. And uh, Spirit of God, I pray for your power and your presence to be manifest in this place. May the man of God be anointed with the Spirit of God to preach the Word of God. Open our ears to hear. And God, at the invitation, if anyone needs to respond in any way, help them step out in faith and do what you call them to do. In Jesus' name we ask these things. And Lord, we love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, good evening, church. So great to be here with you tonight. Great to see everybody. I heard we had a, uh, a packed house in here last night, and praise God for that. So uh, we're going to do a couple of songs, con congregational songs. So y'all stand, and I'm sure you know these. Uh, if not, the words will be on the screen behind us. We're going to start with uh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. How I trust Him, how I prove Him, oh 
secure from all alarms. Praise God. Amen. Let's sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day Submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Let's sing it out. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. In my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love.
God, we thank you that we can stand here and we can praise your holy, perfect, and precious name all day long. We thank you for this time of revival. We thank you for, for, for Reverend Witt and the message he's going to preach to us tonight, Lord. Uh, God, we, uh, we love you, and we are just so thankful we can gather here in this house together this evening. God, prepare our hearts to receive your word. It's in your holy and perfect name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, it's good to see you here on a Monday night. Amen. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, just open your Bibles to the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, and just leave them open there. Revelation chapter 21. I heard about a, a wife that sat up in the bed in the middle of the night. She was screaming. She was crying. And finally, her husband woke up. And he began to try to comfort her and say, well, why are you so upset? Why are you crying? And she said, well, I, I had a dream. And I dreamed that I went to heaven. And in heaven, they were having a husband auction. <laughs> Some husbands were being auctioned for $1,000. Other husbands were being auctioned for $2,000. And finally, the curiosity was getting the best of her husband. He said, well, what were husbands like me going for? And she began to cry even more. And finally, when she regained her composure, she said, well, husbands like you are being bundled together, three bundles for a dollar. <laughs> well, I don't believe we'd see anything like that in heaven. But I do want to preach tonight on the subject, looking into heaven. Let's pray together. Father, I pray, as we open up your word and your word gives us just a, a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. God, I pray that you'll make it real in our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray for those who would be here in this building right now that, that if they were to die, they would not get to go to heaven. God, I pray tonight that they would come to Christ and be saved. And we who are saved, Lord, I pray that... Uh, that we'll have a concern and a, and a burden to want to get as many people as we can to go to heaven with us. And that we'll take that good news of Christ to them. Spirit of God, move in this place tonight. When the invitation is extended, may there be a freedom. May we, quench, may we not quench nor grieve your spirit in any way. But may he have freedom to move here tonight. May your perfect will be accomplished. May the name of Jesus be honored. In Christ's name I pray. And all God's people say again, amen. Revelation chapter 21, beginning there in verse 1. John the Revelator, under the guidance and inspiration of the Spirit of God, wrote, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now I thank God for Revelation 21, verse 4. Look at it. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 
But then in contrast to what's been said in the first seven verses, verse 8 says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and all and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, had a person who came to him one day and said, Mr. Booth, I'm convinced that the training that you give to your personal soul winners is the best training there is today for soul winners. Being the humble man that he was, he said, well, I thank you for saying that. But really, that's not the best training there is for a soul winner. He said the best training for a soul winner would be to spend five minutes in hell. And then they would be a soul winner. And I believe that he was exactly right. If a person could just get a glimpse of hell, it would do away with a casual, don't care attitude that so many people have in regards to witnessing and soul winning. Now tonight, I don't want us to look into hell, but I want us to look into heaven. And I believe if we could just get a glimpse of heaven, that it would literally change our life. You know, when you get an interest in a place, you want to find out everything you can about that place. You know, as an evangelist, I, I travel uh, week after week, you know, to different places. Uh, I shared with you, I think, yesterday, I will be in 43 different revivals or crusades uh, this year, then also going to Ethiopia. So, I travel, you know, week after week. We've been doing that year after year after year. And so uh, I get to go to some very uh, interesting places. For example, how many of you have ever heard of Pumpkin Town, South Carolina? Okay, man, I mean, we got them here. Pumpkin Town, South Carolina is right at the, uh, the, uh, the bottom of, the, of the Table Rock, North Carolina, you know. And... Uh, Sometime back, I preached in a camp meeting in Pumpkin Town, South Carolina. Now, in Pumpkin Town, South Carolina, you know, they got one red light. And when it's turned on, it blinks. <laughs> and then, how many of you have ever heard of Frog Jump, Tennessee? Anybody ever heard of Frog Jump, Tennessee? Frog Jump, Tennessee is in West Tennessee, just uh, north of Memphis. And I was in a revival in Curve. Tennessee, and every night I had to go through Frog Jump. And then, how many of you ever heard of Bug Tussle, Texas? Anybody ever heard of Bug Tussle, Texas? I mean, Bug Tussle, Texas is right outside Dial, Texas, which is right outside Honey Grove, Texas. And um, I actually was preaching in a revival outside Bug Tussle, Texas. Now, in Bug Tussle, Texas, there's only one building, one building. It is the post office, it's the cafe, it's the general store. I mean, everything that is in Bug, bug Tussle is in that one store. And in that store, they, they had these uh, banners uh, for the, it said, Bug Tussle Tusslers. And they had these banners for their ball team that they didn't even have. <laughs> well, I get to go to some very interesting places. But there's a place tonight that I have great interest in. And the reason I have great interest in it is because uh, I've, got some, I've got some loved ones who are already there. It is that city of God, that city of David, that new Jerusalem, that place where Jesus is with the Father. How many of you tonight have a loved one in heaven, a, a father, a Mother, husband, wife, son, daughter, brother, sister. How many of y'all have a loved one that's in heaven? Listen, that ought to give you reason to want to find out everything you can about heaven. And so what I want to do is this. I want us to look into heaven. And I want us to see not what has happened in heaven, not even what is going to happen in heaven, but I want us to look and see What's taking place right now in heaven? Would you like to know? Three things. Number one, I want us to look and see what the 
supernatural beings are doing in heaven. I'm speaking now about the holy angels. God has his holy angels. I heard about two men who were talking one day. One man said to the other man, said, uh, I, I believe my wife is an angel. And the other man said, now wait a minute, I, I know your wife is a very good lady and a very godly lady, but don't you think you're stretched in a little bit to say that you think your wife is an angel? And he said, well, she has to be an angel because she's always up in the air harping about something. <laughs> Amen or, or oh me. Well, God has his holy angels. And what are the angels doing? Well, one thing they're doing, they're shouting praises to his precious name. If you look back just a few pages in Revelation chapter 5, the Bible says there, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels. Now, I want you to underline that phrase there, many angels, because we're going to contrast that a little later. I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What are the angels doing? They're shouting praises to his precious name. Oh, listen. The name of Jesus is worthy to be praised. Isn't it strange that, uh, that we can get excited about everything else in the world? I mean, we'll go out here on a Saturday afternoon to a big old pasture field, and we'll watch uh, 22 men down on that big old pasture field chase a bag of air up and down that pasture field, and we'll hoop and, and we'll holler. Now, don't misunderstand me. I can hoop and holler with the best of them when the big orange is on the field. Now, to be very honest with you, we ain't had much holler about recently. <laughs> Our basketball team is doing a lot better. Oh, that's, yeah, it's that right color orange. <laughs> oh, but isn't it strange? I mean, we can go and hoop and holler there, and but we'll come to church and sit here like a bunch of dead wooden onions. Listen, the name of Jesus is worthy to be praised. And I've made up my mind. I'm not going to let the angels outpraise me. And I'll tell you why. Angels don't know what it is to be saved by the grace of God. Angels don't know what it is to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Angels don't know what it is to experience God's great salvation. And if there's anyone who ought to be praising God, it ought to be the people of God. Amen? And so what are the angels doing? They're shouting praises to his precious name. And then also, they are serving the king for the kingdom. I believe if we could look into heaven tonight, that perhaps we would hear God look over to one of his angels and say, Angel, there's one of my children in trouble. Go down. Watch over. Protect them. You say, you do, do you really believe that? Oh, not only do I believe it, I can prove it to you. Just write these verses there in the margin of your Bible. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him and deliver them. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep Thee. That word keep means to protect you, to keep thee in all thy ways. I could give you a story after story after story. Dr. Sam Cathy was an evangelist of yesterday. How many of you recognize the name Sam Cathy? Okay. Okay, several of you. Brother Sam was one of my closest friends. Uh, Brother Greg and I were talking about him uh, yesterday. And uh, Sam has already gone on to be with the Lord, but he was one of my closest, closest friends. Now, if you know anything about him, I mean, he was an evangelist, and he would skin you alive. Those of you, right? 
And then he'd uh, skin you alive, then throw salt in. Laugh about it. I mean, that's sort of the kind of preacher that he was. And, and I used to kid him and say, Brother Sam, it takes at least six archangels just to keep you out of trouble. I mean, that's just sort of his, who he was. But Brother Sam told about uh, being in a series of revival meetings in, in Michigan. And he'd been there for three weeks. And he was looking forward to going back home. And he was living at that time in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And he was looking forward to going back home to his wife and his three daughters. And he said he went to the airport. And of course, he had his uh, ticket there. And he went to the uh, ticket agent and said, I'd like to get a, a boarding pass and a seat assignment. And the agent looked back and said, well, said, uh, we're having some mechanical difficulties in that plane right now. It's going to be a little while before we're going to be able to take off. Now, doesn't that always bless your heart? I mean, you're having mechanical difficulties. And he said, uh, go ahead and get you something to eat. Come back after a while. And as Brother Sam uh, told the story, he said, I, I went off and got me five or six hot dogs and three or four Coca-Colas. And finally, I made my way back, and I went to the ticket agent, and I said again, I said, I'd like to get a boarding pass at a seat assignment. And the agent looked back at him and said, uh, listen, you were, you've already left here. I mean, you, you were on that plane. And that plane is already left, and I, I put you on that plane. You're on that plane. And Brother Sam said, I looked back at him. I said, well, I hear, I'm here, ain't I? <laughs> and Sam said he heard later that day that that plane crashed. And every person on that plane was killed. Now, Brother Sam was convinced that God just sent an angel there to take his place. Now, that's what he believed. You can believe what you want to believe, that, and I can believe what I want to believe, but that's what Brother Sam believed. But I do know this much. From time to time, God sends angels out to watch over the people of God. Amen? I'd say some of you tonight could even stand and give testimony that there's been those times and those places in your life that only explanation there would be would be that God sent his angel. To watch over you. Amen? And so we see something of what the, the supernatural beings, the angels, are doing in heaven. And then I want us to look and see what the, what the Savior is doing in heaven. I mean, what's Jesus doing in heaven right now? Would you like to know? Let me give you three main things. Number one, Jesus is praying petitions for the saints. Again, I believe if we were to look into heaven, we would see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing? He's praying for me. And he's praying for you. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Listen, Jesus is my advocate. Jesus is my lawyer. Jesus is my attorney. And he's never lost a case. And he will never lose a case. You know, even after we're saved, we still sin. Amen? And when... We sin as Christians. It's almost as if Jesus will look to the Father and say, Father, remember, they're part of the family. When Don Whit sins, and I do, when I sin, it's as if Jesus will look to the Father and say, Father, remember, he's part of the family. And then the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, when we sin as Christians, it's almost as if the, the devil will rush into the presence of God and say, look there at that one that calls himself Christian. I demand the death penalty for them. Oh, but the Father looks over to the Son and remembers that day that Jesus went to the cross. 
And he paid our sin debt there upon the cross. And so as he looks at us, he sees us through the blood and through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank God tonight that I've got a friend in heaven who's praying for me. And his name is Jesus. And so what is Jesus doing in heaven? He's praying petitions for the saints. And then also he's preparing a place for the saints. The Bible says in John 14 verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now look up here. Heaven's a real place. Heaven is not just some ghostly dream out there in yonder, yonder land. Heaven is as real as this place that we've gathered here tonight. Amen? A real place. You say, well, don't you believe that Jesus could just speak a word and there'd be a mansion? Oh, yes. In fact, he wouldn't even have to speak a word. All he'd have to do is just think a thought. <laughs> and there'd be a mansion. You say, what's that mansion going to look like? I believe it's going to look a lot like a mansion. You say, do you really believe there's going to be uh, streets of gold? Oh, yes. You really believe there's going to be gates of pearl? Oh, yes. You really believe there's going to be walls of jasper? Oh, yes. You really believe there's going to be sea of crystal? Oh, yes. You say, oh, what an imagination you have. Listen, if it's not like that, it's even better. Amen? And then also, Jesus is personally present with the saints. The Bible teaches that when a Christian dies, they go immediately into the presence of God. I made that statement, Brother Greg, some time back, and after the service was over, there was a person who came to me and said, uh, don't ever make that statement again. I said, what statement? They said that statement that when a Christian dies, that they go immediately into the presence of God. Now, this is what they said, okay? This is what they said to me. They said, the Bible teaches that when a Christian dies, their body is placed in that grave. And their spirit, their soul, also goes to that grave and sleeps until Jesus comes again. Now, the only thing wrong with that is this. That's wrong. That's wrong. I mean, the Bible teaches that when a Christian dies, they go immediately into the presence of God. Let me give you some verses that just back that up. If you look over at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 32, Jesus there is being questioned by the Sadducees. Now, you do know who the Sadducees were, don't you? They were the liberals of that day. They did not believe in the miracles. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in a resurrection. I mean, uh, they were the liberals of that day. You do know why they were called Sadducees, don't you? They were sad, you see. All liberals are sad. I mean, if you cannot believe in the supernatural things of God, how in the world are you going to have the joy of the Lord? Amen? And so they're questioning Jesus, and they're saying, Jesus, if a, if a woman has been married many times you know, in the resurrection, in heaven, who, who's going to be her, her husband? And I love, in essence, what Jesus said in response. In essence, he said, not going to be any marriages in heaven. Now, to be honest, there are a lot of marriages not too heavenly down here. <laughs> but then Jesus said in verse 32, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham is still alive. Isaac is still alive. Jacob is still alive. If you're saved, you never die. Oh, yes. One day this old body, this old tabernacle where we now live, one day it will die, but the real you will never die. Amen? I mean, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're still alive. And then when Jesus was on the cross, you remember that? dying thief 
looked over to him and said, in essence, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him in Luke 23, verse 43, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. I mean, today you're going to be with me in paradise in heaven. And then there's that passage that we use so often in funerals where Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present for, with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Some of you, this last year, followed the casket of that loved one out here to the graveyard. I've got a good word for you. If they were saved, they're not in that casket. They're not in that grave. Oh, that old body, that old tabernacle where they used to dwell, it's there. But they're not there. I mean, they are with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Listen, that ought to give you comfort tonight. That ought to give you an assurance tonight. And so we see something now of what the Savior, what Jesus is doing in heaven. And then the last thing, and I say the last thing, not, not real quick, but the last main thing I want you to notice is this. What, what are the saints doing in heaven? I mean, what are the Christians doing in heaven? Almost everyone here raised your hand a moment ago and said, you had a loved one in heaven. Would you like to know what mama's doing? What uh, daddy's doing? What that husband, what that wife, what that child, what that loved one is doing in heaven? Now let me give you a word of warning. If you've got any Bapticostic in you whatsoever, you better fasten your pew belt. Because you ain't going to be able to sit there very long. I mean, if this doesn't make you want to jump up and run and shout, something bad wrong with you. Amen? I mean, what are, what are the Christians doing in heaven? Well, one thing they are doing, they are worshiping the worthiness of Christ. If you look back just a page, in Revelation 19, verse 1, the Bible says there, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people. Now, a moment ago, we read the voice of many angels. But here it says, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. And then on down in verse 4 of Revelation 19, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah. I mean, we learned how to do that yesterday morning. Amen. Now, wouldn't you love to get in a service like that? Wouldn't you love to get in a service where people are saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Bring it on, brother. <laughs> now, if that bothers you, you're going to have real problems when you get to heaven. Now, while I'm telling you something, let me tell you something else. I really believe there won't be any printed bulletins in heaven. Now, if that bothers you, you better check up and see if your oil's been changed. Now, while I'm telling you something, let me go ahead and tell you something else. I, I don't think the service is going to be over at 12 o'clock on Sunday. You say, well, I ain't down here either. <laughs> Oh, can you imagine Jesus up there leading the worship? He's going to lead it. I mean, he's leading the worship service. And somebody said, Jesus, you know what time it is? I mean, we've got company coming over. I mean, the roast is about to burn. I mean, they're about ready to kick off in the ball game. Oh, listen, we're not going to be worried about that. I mean, we're going to be able to worship Him and praise Him. Now, I'm very simple-minded about this. If I'm going to spend an eternity in heaven, 
praising and adoring my God. I'm going to practice up on it down here. Amen. Amen. That's right. Hey, Brother Greg, bless y'all. I love y'all, okay? I love y'all. If they were to go to Ethiopia with us, you have been pretty good, pretty good help just to keep up with them over there, don't you? I mean, they know how to, one thing about it, they know how to praise. They know how to worship. But you know, a lot of us is going to be as out of place as screen doors in a submarine. I mean, we're not going to really know what it is to, to really praise God. And, and my idea is, I mean, if that's what we're going to do, we need to practice up on it down here. I was preaching at the Mount Ararat Baptist Church in uh, Treslin, Tennessee. Now, Mount Ararat Baptist Church is an African-American Baptist church. And one of my closest, closest pastor friends pastors that church, Brother Chris Pipkin. He has been at that church for 44 years. And uh, they run about, uh, about 300, 400 there. Treslin doesn't have 100 people that live in that city. And so uh, all of the African-American people that live in our whole region, that's where they, they go to church there. And uh, I've been able to do at least three revivals in that church. I love going there. I just love going there. You know, when you go there, you, they get you in the rhythm. You know what I mean? And, you know, I get to preach it, and they get to preaching back at me. And I cannot sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But they even get me singing. I mean, I get to preaching, and they get to singing it back to me. And I sort of get in that sing-song rhythm and going like that. And I got in one of those uh, rocking, moving moods one day and got to preaching. And by the way, <laughs> well, I shouldn't tell this. The last time I was there on the last night of the revivals on Friday night, I told them, I said, I'd like to package you all up and take you to a bunch of these dead white churches I had to preach in every week. <laughs> but I was preaching, and all of a sudden, there was a dear little lady who was sitting up here on the front row, and all of a sudden, glory got all over her. All of a sudden, she jumped up, and she began to dance around like this, and she turned loose, and she ran around the auditorium. And I just kept on preaching. After the service was over, two of my white brethren that were there that night, came up to me and said, uh, Preacher, uh, didn't it bother you when that woman ran that way? I said, oh, goodness, no. I said, if I hadn't been so out of shape, I'd run with her. <laughs> I mean, what are, what are the Christians doing in heaven? They're worshiping the worthiness of Christ. And then also they're praising the provisions of Christ. Now think of some of the provisions. There is the provision of rest. Revelation 14, verse 13 says, And I heard a voice in heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Notice, their works do follow them. Now, we're not saved by works. We're saved by God's grace and God's grace alone. Amen? But our works... Do follow us. Brother Greg, you know, sometime a person will come down the aisle and essence will say, Preacher, punch my ticket so I can get to go to heaven. And then, you know, they'll go out and forget God, continue their old way of life, and they're drinking, they're carousing. But then they have the idea that one day when they die, they're just going to step over in heaven. A perfect apostle Paul. No way. No way. If you live like the devil, that's a good indication you're going to the devil. Amen. Listen, you and I ought to so live after we are saved that one day when we get into heaven, that others in heaven will say, there's a man 
There's a woman, there's a young person that was totally sold out for Jesus Christ. Listen, this is no time for lackadaisical, lukewarm, take it or leave it Christianity. We need to be whole hogged for Jesus. Amen? I mean, they're praising Him for the provision of rest. And then also they're praising Him for the provision of service. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 15. The Bible says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. I mean, they serve Him day and night. Listen, heaven is not a place of inactivity. Heaven is a place of activity. I mean, can't you imagine? Again, I'm not picking on Brother Greg, but I'll, let's just put me and you together, okay? Let's, let's imagine. I mean, can you imagine if God were to just put us out here on some little fluffy cloud and we got our angel wings? Well, wouldn't we be a sight? <laughs> and we're plucking a, that harp for all eternity. All this in heaven is not like that. Heaven's going to be a place of activity where we serve Him. Now, do you ever, you ever get busy down here doing th- something? I mean, really, you get involved in it, and then all of a sudden, that cell phone rings. <laughs> or you can't wait for Saturday to get here, guys, because you've got some project you want to do. But when Saturday shows up, I mean, honey's got some honeydews that she wants you to do. Amen. You don't have the nerve to say amen. (laughs) Oh, but listen, in heaven, we're going to be able to serve him day and night. Night and day. Day and night. Night and day. No Hattatol. No Geritol. No vitamin B. I mean, we're going to be able to serve him forever and forever and forever. And never get weary. Never get tired. And then also they are praising him for the provision of healing. Again, Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The last time some of you saw that loved one, their body was being dragged down to the grave with cancer. No cancer in heaven. No heart attacks in heaven. No COVID in heaven. No cripples in heaven. No blindness in heaven. I mean, we're going to have perfect health. Amen? I mean, what are the Christians doing in heaven? They're worshiping the worthiness of Christ. They're praising the provision of Christ. And then also they are expecting the entrance of Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You say now, preacher, are, are you saying that right now that when a Christian dies, they go to heaven and, and they have a, a spirit body? That's right, right now. You say, what's that spirit body going to look like? I don't know exactly, but I'd say it probably looks better than most of us do here tonight. (laughs) Oh, but one of these days, the father is going to look over to the son and say, Jesus, go get your church. Go get your bride. And the Lord is going to ascend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and all the saved of all the ages are going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to be given a new body like unto His glorious body. Amen? Oh, what a day. What a day that's going to be. I can imagine in heaven tonight that the Christians are saying to Jesus, Jesus, when are you going to go get your church? When are you going to go get your bride? And Jesus is saying, just a little longer. Just a little longer. And then 
Last of all, I want to mention, what are the Christians doing in heaven? They are rejoicing over the redemptions to Christ. I mean, Christians in heaven rejoice when souls are saved here on earth. You say, do you really believe that? Oh, not only do I believe it, I can prove it to you. If you look over in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells us there are about three lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Notice when that sheep was found in verse 7. The Bible says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And then notice when that coin was found on down in verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Notice, not that the angels are rejoicing, but there is joy in the presence of the angels. Who's that? That's the Christians. That's the believers. And then notice when that lost son, that prodigal son, came back home. Notice what the father said in verse 24. He said, therefore, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And his elder son was in the field. And, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He heard music and dancing. You say, well, he must not have been a Baptist. Music and, and dancing. Uh, now, I know your pastor's heart well enough. And I hope I know you well enough. When people get saved down here in this altar, you can dance all you want to, to the glory of God. Amen? I was in South Africa several years ago. And... Um, we, I was preaching every night in a tent crusade. And during the day, uh, I had a group of our men that went with us that were building a church building. And actually, the people that got saved in the tent crusade every night actually became the church. And so they were building the church for them. And um, now listen, you give me a hammer and a saw, and I can do more damage in 30 minutes than the whole crew could fix in the whole week. Rosita will testify to that, won't you? I mean, I, I can tear up more than you ever realize with my hands. I mean, whenever I start trying to fix something, it just falls apart, literally. And uh, the men said to me, said, Preacher, said, you go and do your thing during the day. You go and preach and leave the building to us. <laughs> And so uh, during the day, I, I would go and preach in the, in the schools there in South Africa. I, I don't believe you heard me. I went into the public schools and preached the gospel. I went into the public schools and, and preached the gospel and gave an invitation. And, and people would get saved. God have mercy on America. Last week, I'll just throw this in. I got to do something that you don't get to do in most places. I went into a public school last week. And they actually let me preach, present the gospel. And we had eight teenagers that got saved. Amen. Now, don't, don't tell anybody because they'll come after us. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'd go and preach there in those schools in South Africa. And one day I had uh, some of the men there come to me and say, Preacher, would you want to go over to one of the neighboring villages this afternoon and preach? I said, oh, yes, love to. And so we loaded all of our sound equipment and the keyboard and a power generator. We loaded that all up in the back of the truck, and we traveled about 30 miles over to another great big village. And we set it up right in the middle of that village where two roads crossed together. And so... Uh, they cranked that generator up, and I mean, they began to play on that keyboard. I mean, you could hear it 20 miles away. And people began to just gather in there, and they began to sing, and, and they began to praise, and, and they did that for a while. You understand what I mean? 
they did it for a while. <laughs> and they sang and they praised. And, and finally, I, I stepped forward. And I presented just a very simple message on how to be saved. Just presented the gospel. Gave an invitation. And there was over 25 adults that stepped out of that crowd and gave their hearts to Christ. And they were saved. Man. And so they cranked that power generator up again. And they began to play on that keyboard. And, and they began to sing. And they began to praise. And they began to dance. But I was a good Baptist boy. I mean, I, I stood there. I patted that foot. I clapped my heads. I mean, I was happy. And one of the big African men walked over to me and said, Preacher not happy? I said, Preacher happy? He said, Well, Preacher happy, why him not dance? I said, Whoa, let's go! Whoa! <laughs> You say, well, I'm just not the emotional type. Yes, you are. When something's important to you, you get emotional about it. You let that new car get a dent in it. You let your favorite ball team lose. I mean, you let that little child that's so dear to you get sick. You get emotional about it. And when souls are important to you, you get emotional about it. And I want to tell you, souls are important to God. And we need to get our excitement in line with what heaven gets excited about. And heaven rejoices when souls are saved. Looking into heaven. Let me share with this with you, and I'm finished. Several years ago, my oldest son, Brad, was a student there at Mid-America Seminary in Memphis. And he pastored a, a church in Atoka, Tennessee, just north of Memphis. It was on a Friday night, about 11, 11.30, my phone rang. Now, if you call me 11, 11.30 at night, you're going to wake me up. And so uh, I got my phone, and I looked at the caller ID to see whether or not I want to answer it or not. Now, don't look so pious. You do the same thing. And so I, I saw his Brad. And I put it up to my face. And I said, boy, it better be important. <laughs> and he said, Dad, it is important. I said, what's going on? He said, well, today, one of our members, a young lady, 34 years old, just fell dead. Didn't know she was sick. Didn't know she had any problem whatsoever. She just fell dead. She had a little, has a little son, David, seven years old. I mean, had a daughter, Amy, seven years old. Had a son, David, five years old. And he said, Dad, I've got to preach her, her funeral this coming Monday. And he said, I don't know what to say. I said, well, let's pray a while. So we prayed together that night. I waited until Monday evening, and I called him, and I said, Brad, how'd the funeral go? He said, never seen anything like it in all my life. This lady was a daughter of a pastor there in Memphis. She was, had a very beautiful voice, and she'd sung all over the Mid-South area. Many of her songs had been recorded. And he said, for the music for the funeral, they used her songs of her singing that were recorded. And some way, somehow, the little son, David, got loose from his daddy. And he ran up to the casket, and he could hear his mother's voice. And he ran up to the casket and said, Mama, where are you at? Mama, where are you at? And he ran over to the speakers. He could hear her voice, and he said, Mama, where are you at? Where are you at? And Brad said, it literally just tore up the whole funeral service. Listen, one of these days, little David's going to hear his mama's voice again. And he'll know where she's at because he'll be with her. Listen, one of these days, I'm going to literally, actually look into heaven. You know why? 
because I'm going to be in heaven. And if you're saved, one of these days, you will literally, actually look right into heaven because you'll be in heaven. Now let me ask you this question. Do you know for certain if you were to die right now, you'd be with God in heaven? If I was here tonight and I did not know that I know that I know that if I were to die, I'd be with God in heaven. There'd be no way I'd walk out those doors until I got it settled once and for all. I'm going to ask you if you will to bow your heads, close your eyes. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Now I want to ask you that same question. Do you know for certain if you were to die this very moment, you'd be with God in heaven? I'm not asking you, do you have you joined the church? Have you been baptized or sprinkled or have you walked down a church aisle? But I'm asking you, has there been a time and a place in your life where you repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus Christ alone to save you? I mean, do you know for certain if you were to die at this very moment, you'd be with God in heaven because you've been saved? If you can say that and know that, I'm going to ask you as I ask you yesterday, just, just lift up your hand as a testimony of that fact. Now, don't lift it unless you know it. Be honest. Don't lift it if you don't know it. Okay, thank you. God bless you. The Bible says, He that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, maybe that you did not lift up your hand, or maybe you even lifted up your hand, but you say, Preacher, really, this is something that's troubled me for a long time. And I really have never really had a real assurance to know for certain that if I were to die, I'd be with God in heaven. Well, I'm going to ask you, if you did not lift up your hand or you don't have that assurance that you really know that you know, I'm going to ask you to let me lead you in a prayer. You make this your prayer where you ask God, forgive you of your sin and ask Christ to come to your life to save you. You may want to pray out loud. You may want to pray silently. But the main thing is you pray it in your heart, pray it to God and really mean it. Will you do it right now? Do away with the doubts. Let me lead you in that prayer right now. Pray with me. Right where you're sitting. Pray with me right now. Get the doubts going away. Get it settled right now. Pray with me. Say, dear God, I know you love me. I know Jesus died for me on the cross. I know Jesus came out of that grave and he's alive. But God, I have sinned against you and I'm lost. And I cannot save myself. God, forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, come in my heart right now and save my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. Now, I'm going to ask every one of you that asked Jesus to save you just then, the best you knew how. I'm going to ask you, as I asked you yesterday, if you will just 